reading about the bullets, massive chunk of lead with tin in it to make them softer. And I thought, gosh, these are really man killers, you know. And then I read about it, and after the Zulu Wars and the Afghan Wars, the British sold them to hunters to kill elephants. One bullet would stop a bull elephant. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I said. And then I put the, the explosives in the cartridge. And I thought it was about four times the amount of explosives than there is in a normal bullet. And I got down the range and I suddenly realised that that gun hadn't been fired for over a hundred years. <laughs> so I closed my eyes. Because <laughs> it really helps, doesn't it, when you close your eyes. And I tell you what, the hole it blew through the target, you would not believe it. And then the sights go up to a thousand yards. It's amazing, isn't it? Anyway, that's that stuff. I used to be where I was the original Warwick Bowman, Warwick Castle for years. And when I left, I trained all the students who used to work in the summer to shoot the bow for fun. And these kids who were cheated out of their wages, that's why I left. All clubbed together and bought me that as a farewell present. And that is 1066. That is your earliest of your early. We don't know if it's Saxon or Viking, it could be either. But it's exactly the same and it's an iron arrowhead. But if you noticed what's different about it. Oh, you couldn't pass me that, could you please? Is there a penny in it? Cheers. It's got a tang that fits down the arrow and then it's whipped, it's tied to the arrow. Normally, um, from what we can tell, with wet rawhide, very, very thin rawhide, and then when it dries, it shrinks onto the arrowhead. But very quickly, this is a reproduction. They went into socketed arrows because the center of the arrow, its shaft, tries to burst out through the point. So you kind of get a double knock as it hits you, then within a millisecond, it punches the arrow in. And this one is, dug up in France. Now we cannot claim, you cannot claim it's from any particular bar uh, battle, but this has got to have been, because of the area, from the campaign that surrounds Agincourt. But what makes this more precious than anything is it still has a piece of arrow in it. Yeah. Now there are no medieval arrows left, no English or Welsh medieval arrows, there just are not. The Tudors used them all up, because they're selfish like that. And so that for me is a little bit of the, the historical grail, yeah? What would have been that? What would Ash. Have and it's ash. <laughs> Love ash. And then this one, my last one, is slightly earlier, dug up in France, and this is your heavy bodkin. But this has actually hit something because the, uh, the socket has, has burst out. So it either hits a stone in the ground, an armoured knight, horse, damsel in distress, <laughs> child held up high by father. You know, the kind of thing. Yeah. And these are so common. This is a buy knife, an eating knife. These were made by the bucket loads by blacksmiths. Everybody had their own eating knife. You never shared cutlery in those days. Most people's eating stuff was just a spoon anyway, a wooden spoon. But a buy knife was to cut your meat and they just had a single pricker, not a fork, just to lift up the meat and take it from that. But most people, they very, very rarely had meat, very rarely had bread. They lived a diet basically of peas, beans and oats all boiled up into a broth called pottage. Two meals a day, that was your lot. And this is what the Normans did to us. Before the Normans came, girls didn't marry until they were at least 16. And there was an old tradition that the Normans crushed, was if you have somebody in the village that's gonna marry, then the whole village gather, shape and make all the bits that's necessary for their house. There is a patch of ground put aside for them in the village. And on the wedding day, the house is there laid out in kit form. They raise the house. Now that's the men. The women, meanwhile, are doing everything else for the inside of the house. So at the end of the feasting in the afternoon, because it should all be over by about one o'clock, the building and the raising of the house. After the feasting in the afternoon, you would walk the married couple to their house. He will pick up his, what, his bride, carry her in. But the Normans crushed it. It survived a little bit in Wales. Some of the Normans, they just crushed absolutely everything we had. So much so that girls were married off as young as five, six or seven. In the early years, there was an 11-year-old girl died giving birth. They were totally different. They were vicious, but they knew they couldn't face the Saxons face on. They'd learned that at Hastings. 
So what they did was they went around it, about it in a different way. When they stood against the, the Normans in the north, they burnt every ounce of crops, killed every single animal they could find and poisoned every well. 2007, was it? 270,000 Saxons approximately starved to death. They then started to build their churches over ours and then they brought their church law. Show in your ears, we'll cut them off. Wearing trousers, we'll burn you alive. Well, I won't, but the church will. There were two kinds of laws, church law, Norman law. The Saxon law, we've now got part of it back. You can't marry until you're 16. Yeah, all of that kind of stuff. But the Normans, they really got us until individual outlaws fought back and they hated us. And it was then they realized that that longbow behind me was a very simple weapon to use. So eventually they began to embrace it and they passed the law that every boy, now there's a bit of a dispute because it changes through the years. Uh, let's say from the age of seven had to shoot the bow two hours after church every Sunday. Consequently, come the Hundred Years War, they had a standing army, English and Welsh bowmen. Brilliant sense of humor, incredibly good looking men, absolute savage killers. Except for one problem, if you were married, you took your wife to war. Why do you think men go to war? Yeah? And now they're allowing girls in the front line. How difficult is that? Yeah, when I was in the army, girls didn't come all the way to the front line. My son's in the army now. I said, what's it like? Is it really good? And I says, why? He says, you've got somebody interesting to talk to. <laughs> Time's changed, don't it? Right, I'm going to shoot, and I'm going to shoot fast, because this was the idea of the bowmen. Once they'd been got into harness, and they were used in war, it was not a case of picking off individuals. You can do that when they get nice and close. Mm. The idea is you shoot fast and furious. So we'll have a go at the... That looks a bit weird, those two arrows, anyway. <laughs> yeah? I'll have a go at the arrow sticking up out the head of the... Uh, the man target, which I use because children like it. I made a full-sized, anatomically correct human body once, covered him in clothes, yeah. and I'm a Warwick Castle, and I was saying to the audience, where do you want me to shoot him next? And an Australian voice said, hit him in the nuts, mate. <laughs> and all the little children just went, yeah, in the nuts. <laughs> so, the, the management of Warwick says, could you refrain <laughs> actually encouraging the audience to shoot because it upsets. I says, who does it upset? Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs>